Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rachel McKenzie, the managing attorney at Pro Bono Project Silicon Valley and chair of this year's Santa Clara County Domestic Violence Conference. And it's my honor to be here in this capacity. And I wanna thank the Santa Clara County Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention because without them, this conference would not be possible. And just a reminder to look at our upcoming webinars throughout the remainder of the month of October, including our three-day strangulation institute at the end of the month, uh, which will be able to provide CLEs and CEUs. So to check out that kind of information, find other materials, you would want to look at sccnviolence.org. And now it's our pleasure to present Universal Education, a local approach to improving health outcomes for survivors through integration. And our panelists include Melissa Luke. Melissa is the Associate Director of Wellness Service at Aki, where she oversees Aki's Domestic Violence and Anti-Human Trafficking Program, Asian Women's Home. Melissa has been part of the movement to end violence against women and girls for 19 years. She sits on the leadership teams of the Domestic Violence Advocacy Consortium of Santa Clara County, the YWCA Peninsula Donor Advised Fund, the East San Jose Peace Partnership, she is also a commissioner on the Santa Clara County Domestic Violence Council and a board member of the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. Originally from Los Angeles, Melissa is a second generation Chinese American, second, pardon me, second generation Chinese American and has a BA in feminist studies from Stanford University. We also today have Elizabeth Hunt. Elizabeth Hunt is the senior QI manager for Aki Health Center. Liz is over 30 years experience providing behavioral health and primary care for at-risk safety net populations, including 10 years as the chief executive officer of the Indian Health Center in San Jose. She is experienced in complex project management that incorporates multiple viewpoints and creates programs that are high quality, patient-centered, and operationally effective. She is also vice president of the board of the San Jose Conservation Corps and Charter School. And we have Erica Villa. She is the manager of community prevention at Nextdoor Solutions to Domestic Violence. Erica has been key in developing Nextdoor Solutions initiatives in the areas of community prevention, leveraging her deep knowledge and local community to focus on improving health outcomes and preventing gender-based violence. In 2016, she spearheaded the pilot initiative to help develop a DV and healthcare partnerships toolkit designed to help healthcare providers develop or improve their internal processes to better screen and provide universal education on the benefits, I'm sorry, on the effects of violence on health on children so that individuals and families who are in abusive situations can connect with help available through a domestic violence agency. I wanna welcome our panelists. Our learning objectives for today's webinar are to provide a model for others to replicate to share best practices and lessons learned, and to address COVID impacts it, to issues regarding care, to pivoting to telecare, and many other surrounding issues. 
I do want to remind everyone, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A section. The panelists will be addressing them. As well, please do remember to fill out the post webinar survey to ensure increased audience participation and participant and audience satisfaction. And with that, it is truly my honor to turn this program over to our learned panelists. Thank you, Rachel. Hey, can everyone see that? Yeah, excellent. excellent. Great. Uh, so thank you so much to the Domestic Violence Council, the Office of Gender-Based Violence, um, for the opportunities today um, to share our journey um, at the intersection of health and intimate partner violence. Uh, so there is a lot of content we're going to go through today. Really, each section could be a presentation in its own right. Um, so our hope today is to just, just give you an overview. And, um, you know, as Rachel said, we will be more than happy to discuss offline. Okay, so you've heard our learning objectives. Here's our agenda. Uh, so in brief, we're gonna talk about the health, behavioral health and wellness impacts of intimate partner violence or domestic violence. Uh, talk about the um, model that we're currently using here in Santa Clara County called Q's. Um, the most important piece really is to hear from our survivors um, and their experiences and um, how their experience have, have informed this work. And then of course we'll have Q&A. Um, so I think we're going to be monitoring Q&A throughout the presentation and we'll just um, see how the timing works out. We may answer throughout or at the end, depending. Okay, so um, why does this matter? Um, so if y'all are already here, I'm assuming you already um, believe that this matters. And so this is gonna be an easy sell for all of you. Um, yeah, at the same time, we'd like to share a little bit about, about our grounding, our vision and our mission for, for this particular project. Um, so ultimately we want our community to be safe, healthy and strong. Uh, we want individuals and families who are experiencing domestic violence or intimate partner violence to receive high quality integrated care um, and care that really addresses the social factors and the systemic inequities that are preventing them from living a safe and healthy life. So uh, in terms of how we ended up focusing on intimate partner violence, um, uh, I believe we're the, the third or fourth um, day of this month long um, conference. And so, you know, I think everyone has already heard about the, the prevalence of intimate partner violence in our society, locally, nationally. Um, in brief, we know that one in four women experience IPV, uh, one in seven men, that rates can be even higher in our underserved communities, LGBTQ community, uh, undocumented communities, um, communities of color. Um, in the API community, studies show, you know, as much as 40 to 60% of women um, of, of Asian and Pacific Islander women in the US um, will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. Um, so I think we probably all know that. Um, perhaps what we may not know is uh, the impacts related to health. So in the US, intimate partner violence for women is actually more prevalent than breast cancer and diabetes. Uh, and we're gonna go over more of those specific, uh, you know, physical and mental impacts. Um, studies have also shown that survivors are four times more likely to seek help uh, from, um, you know, after speaking to a healthcare professional. Uh, you know, I think that, that we are grounded in an understanding that access to high quality culturally responsive care is, is a health equity issue. It's a social justice issue. Um, it is a human right. Uh, it is not a privilege reserved just for the lucky few who may happen to have the right income, language, ability, or immigration status. Um, according to the UN, everyone has a right to the standard of living adequate for health and wellness for themselves and their families. And that includes food, clothing, housing, medical care. Okay. So, um, you know, do want to mention that uh, we're probably going to be using IPV and DV interchangeably. Uh, IPV or intimate partner violence is more widely recognized in the medical field. Um, social services we tend to use domestic violence or DV. So, uh, I feel like this, this issue of IPV and public health has really bubbled to the surface in the last, let's say, five to ten years when we've really started recognizing uh, violence, violence in the home, violence in the community as a public health issue. 
Um, the impacts of IPD on health, physical and mental are numerous. They can last a lifetime. They can ripple through generations of a family. Um, so, you know, not just partners, but elders and children as well. I think that, um, uh, you know, what, what we've seen historically is that uh, oftentimes our healthcare providers um, may be treating the results of intimate partner violence, but not necessarily have the, you know, the tools um, or the training um, to identify or provide support of the root cause of the injury, which is domestic violence. Um, on the side of the domestic violence providers, um, historically we have not necessarily uh, focused on health or behavioral health. And again, that has changed, but you know, um, historically we've looked at things like uh, housing, um, safety, um, you know, shelter, uh, legal, and, and all of those other issues, um, but not necessarily health and wellness. So, you know, that said, as we uh, as really looked at the intersection of this work, um, we looked at research, statistics, we realized a few things. Um, we realized that survivors uh, are, if you look at their mental health, um, are more than twice as likely to experience depression, um, almost twice as likely to have substance use disorders. Um, in terms of sexual reproductive health, sexual coercion, uh, women who are experiencing IPD are more likely to have a low birth weight baby, um, more likely to experience STIs, um, and, uh, you know, just a range of injury uh, up to potentially, um, you know, death and injury, um, a very high proportion of, of women uh, who um, have experienced homicides in this country is due to domestic violence, unfortunately. So numerous physical and behavioral health impacts. Um, so I'm not gonna read through this list. Uh, we'll give folks a moment, however, to, to digest um, and take a look. So health impacts are numerous, right? Um, and what that means is that the impacts of a health-based interaction or health-based intervention can be particularly inter you know, effective um, in addressing this issue of IPD. Um, and you know, the impacts of a model like Q's uh, can have a, a very strong and positive impact on a patient's ability to seek help for their relationships, um, which will then improve their physical and mental well-being. Um, so, you know, we really have the opportunity to create, create a virtuous circle uh, of healing, of wellness, if we have the resources and the political will um, to address this issue and really impact an individual's life. So that's the individual impact. Uh, and of course, uh, we want to talk about the impacts on public health. Um, so I am going to share this video. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Okay, computer sound is shared. What determines how long we'll live? Is it what we do? Is it who we are? Actually, when it comes to predicting how long you'll live, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. Here's how this works. Meet Deb and Maria. They both have jobs, they're around the same age, they're both married, and they both have two kids. Deb lives in A-Town, while Maria lives in Beeville, less than one mile away. They're similar in so many ways, but here's the thing. 
On average, residents of Beeville will die more than 15 years sooner than the residents of A-Town. Why? Because where you live is about more than just your address. It's about your opportunities. For example, Deb and Maria's access to healthy options is really different. In A-Town, Deb's family is surrounded by healthy food options, including farmer's markets, specialty shops, and grocery stores. The air in A-Town is cleaner and fresher, and there are lots of safe, clean parks where Deb can exercise and her children can play. A-Town has good public schools for Deb's kids and easy access to emergency and preventive health care. On the other hand, Beeville has broken, badly lit sidewalks, and the parks are unsafe. The air is filled with truck exhausts from the nearby highway. And for food options, Maria's only choices are Beeville's many liquor stores, fast food places, or convenience stores. The schools in Beeville are overcrowded and undersupported. And even if Maria can get her kids into better schools far away, she needs to figure out how to get them there without access to a car. So for Maria, having to juggle so much to find healthy options can be an overwhelming source of chronic stress, which is a serious health risk factor. In fact, for all the residents of Beeville, chronic stress drives health problems like obesity, diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. How did A-Town and Beeville get so different? Well, in many cases in cities and towns across California, the root cause was racial and economic discrimination. Over the generations, poor white people and people of color were pushed to less desirable parts of town, where banks refused to lend money, businesses left, jobs too, schools declined, and the neighborhood crumbled. Everyone who could move away did. And what's more, when communities like A-Town and Beeville are so unequal, Beeville isn't the only one that suffers. Because it turns out that not only is your zip code a predictor of how long you live, so is what country you live in. Countries with the greatest income inequality have the lowest life expectancy. So even Americans like Deb, who are white, insured, college educated, and upper income, die younger than their peers in other countries. In fact, our life expectancy is 43rd in the world, and that number is slipping. In the end, our biggest health risk may actually be inequality, and extreme inequality hurts us all. So what do we do? Well, if we're all going to be healthier, we don't just need to help the folks in Beeville beat the odds. We need to change the odds for everyone. And that's what we're doing. There's a movement happening. We're Californians. We don't follow. We lead. We are building the power to make health happen in communities across the state. We are coming together to build one California, a smarter, more inclusive, and equitable state that creates health and opportunity for all of us. Join us. To learn more, visit buildinghealthycommunities.org. The video talked about changing the odds, right? And that, that that's what we need to do. Um, so I would propose that doing this work at the intersection of IPD and health is one way we help change the odds for everyone. Um, because violence in the home is a social determinant of health. It is one of the many environmental factors that affects population health outcomes. Um, so, you know, we uh, have listed some of those social determinants that impact um, our survivors, our, our families, our communities, health and wellness. Um, so violence actually isn't on the list. There's no community violence, there's no domestic violence. Um, however, uh, we could say that intimate partner violence um, impacts and is impacted by many of these factors. So how do you afford medication if you don't have stable employment? How do you have stable employment if your partner is constantly harassing and threatening you at work? How do you stay well nourished 
when your partner has put you on a weekly allowance and you barely have enough money to pay for food for your kids, let alone for yourself. And you um, are starving yourself so that you can put food on the table for your kids. How do you go see a doctor when you're the person who's harming you, doesn't let you drive and you don't know where to get a bus pass? How do you, you know, uh, help your young child um, to go see the dentist um, because his teeth are hurting when, you know, their, their father um, uh, does not allow it and that's part of the controlling behavior. Um, if someone is showing symptoms for traumatic brain injury, wouldn't it be helpful to know that their abuser regularly strangles them? So health centers, um, you know, it, it's the job of the health center and of our wonderful health providers to fix the symptoms of what ails us, right? To fix our broken bones, to prescribe our medications. Um, but until we address those root causes, um, which in this case is the violence that is bringing survivors, families, communities into the health center in the first place, um, it can really become a vicious cycle of injury. Injury, temporary healing, injury again. So, uh, if we're talking about root causes, um, it's a question of how do we really roll that analysis into the healthcare setting? Um, how do we address all of these factors, all these social determinants of health before patients even step into our clinics? How do we prevent those symptoms from happening in the first place? Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the analysis that, that we're doing um, with social determinants of health. So folks are probably, are probably also very familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, so how do people become self-actualized? Uh, how do individuals achieve higher level functioning um, and live uh, a full life, a full uh, life of health and wellness? Um, and as we know, we have to address those needs at the bottom of the pyramid. Physiological needs, safety and security needs, um, the needs that are perhaps most impacted in an intimate partner relationship. Um, you know, intimate partner violence, certainly we, you know, I think can imagine the physiological effects. That's usually, I think, what people think of when they think of domestic violence, they think of broken bones and really severe physical effects. Um, but there's also the emotional and psychological factors and the safety and security. Um, and until, again, until we address those factors um, in homes, uh, we will not be able to have that, that uh, health, healthy um, and safe um, community that we're all looking for. Okay. Uh, so this really just, you know, brings back the point around um, social determinants of health and really just um, how heavily they do impact individuals' health and wellness. Uh, so, you know, as much as 80% of our health outcomes are being driven by the social determinants, 70, 80%. Okay, so uh, I am now gonna turn the presentation over to uh, Erica. Erica, you have to unmute. Thank you. Um, so as I'm preparing my presentation, before I get into it of why it is important to address intimate partner violence in the healthcare setting, I wanted to formally introduce um, El Comité de Mujeres Fuertes. Um, this is a very important group that provides us with um, with advice on how to improve our systems and our services, not only at Nextdoor Solutions, but um, overall in our county, and in particular, what impacts um, survivors. So a little history about El Comité de Mujeres Fuertes. It was established in 2017. This is a group of monolingual Spanish-speaking survivors of domestic violence. Um, so we uh, recruited um, from our support groups, um, survivors that wanted to um, be part of the change to um, not only um, be seen as survivors, but also leaders in the community that can advise and make recommendations uh, to create those um, systems change. So um, currently, El Comité is a survivor 
led closed group uh, with five committed members um, that even during these difficult times have continued to participate in an array of activities such as this one that advocate to reduce uh, violence in our communities and they advise next door solutions and also other groups such as Aki on how to improve services, services and identify those gaps and systems for survivors of domestic violence. And so um, for the first two years, uh, what we focused on um, is training. They've developed their mission. They've established guiding principles. Um, they build a relationship not only with themselves, but also with uh, Next Door Solutions staff. And they've also been practicing public speaking. So, and the reason why it's important to have these types of groups um, participate and leaders of the com community participate is because we wanna look at those gaps. I think right now with the pandemic, it's a good opportunity to look at those inequities that are being heightened. And one of those is language access. So for example, right now in this Zoom presentation, we were not able to provide language access to other languages. I get that it's for professionals, but we do have leaders in the community that can provide input on how to improve changes. And also if we want them to participate in promising practices, we have to look at those inequities that already exist and address them at all levels, especially in systems level. So rather than, um, having our community members share their stories and provide that type of input, have them be part of the solution. I think this is time where it's not only time to unify locally, but unify, create unity um, at the local and national and even international level. Um, and that way we can create more changes. So here they're gonna be sharing part of their story, but also sharing uh, recommendations of what was missing when they went to uh, their medical setting to see their doctor, what can be done differently. And so I really want to highlight those things. And also, we created this group so that they can also advocate not only for themselves, but for those voices of the survivors that can't advocate for themselves either, um, and provide advice and evaluation of the services and the systems and tell us like what is it that we need to change just how you know what we're trying to do here with with this intervention so i am going to um have first rose who will share as to why it's important to address intimate partner violence in the healthcare setting adelante rose and i i am not going to translate this um, you can read it from the screen because I think it's important for even the audience to have a little bit of the experience of what individuals who don't speak the language experience when they either have to be part of, of a presentation that they may not understand or they have to go and receive services from someone that doesn't speak their language, doesn't understand their culture, doesn't understand their background. And so I think this is important. So I'm going to have, I'm going to give the mic to Rose. Adelante, Rose. Okay. okay. Me llamo Rose, soy sobreviviente de violencia doméstica. Um, es importante formar una relación de confianza con nuestro doctor. Así tuviéramos la confianza de hablar sobre nuestra relación de pareja. Si el doctor reconoce que no estamos en una relación sana, él o ella nos podrá recomendar servicios como Next Door Solutions. Next Door Solutions nos informará sobre nuestros derechos y nos puede ayudar a planear cómo salirnos de esa relación. También la información le podría ayudar al doctor saber de dónde inicia alguna de nuestras enfermedades o lesiones. Algunas enfermedades son más comunes en personas que han pasado por este, uh, o está empezando, perdón, que han pasado o estén pasando por la violencia doméstica, como el diabetes, asma, ansiedad, depresión, drogadicción, enfermedades de transmisión sexual y mucho más. Este, voy a darles un ejemplo de una situación mía. Um, durante el embarazo de mi primer hijo, fui al hospital de la emergencia por una lesión en mi rodilla. 
les dije que me había caído. A los dos meses fui otra vez a, a la misma hospital de emergencia porque me había caído de las escaleras. El doctor de la emergencia nunca me cuestionó con por qué me estaba cayendo tan seguido. Me imagino que no había, no se había fijado a mi historia médica. Después de a una semana fui a mi cita regular con mi ginecóloga. Tampoco me preguntó por mis citas a la emergencia, por qué había ido. Siempre andaba corriendo y muy, muy apurada. Quizás hubiera yo compartido mi situación con ellos si me hubiera dado, el, si el doctor o la doctora me hubiera dado el tiempo uh, o me hubieran brindado la confianza. Lamentablemente así no fue y estuve en una relación no, san, no saludable por 25 años. Por eso es muy importante que los doctores trabajen junto con las agencias como Next Door Solution para entrenarse, para lograr tener una mejor relación con sus pacientes y proveer recursos necesarios. Gracias. Gracias, Rose. Thank you, Rose. So the key points that um, Rose made is that it's important for medical providers to take their time to build and establish the relationship with the patient, to get to know um, their experiences and review that medical history of what, um, what history of, of events like going to an emergency room twice um, and making that connection when they're coming to a visit. Also being able to make that connection between domestic violence and health conditions, making that connection and helping them understand that how it is, how these, um, the domestic violence is impacting their health. And also reviewing the medical history before each visit um, so that they know historically what has happened um, and they can address it at that visit. And establish partnerships with domestic violence agencies um, in order to get the help and if someone discloses you have to know where to refer them and so knowing what domestic violence agencies are in the area it's very important so now we will have anna who will share adelante anna anna adelante nos escucha Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ana. Uh, yo quiero decir que la visita al doctor es un derecho que lleva a una vida digna y saludable. Es muy importante cuando el doctor está con el paciente que mantenga sus manos desocupadas, sin el celular, sin la computadora. Que su mirada esté frente a los pacientes, sobre todo mostrarse completamente relajado y que nos diga que, que es confidencial lo que nos lo puede preguntar. ¿Te sientes confortable y seguro en tu hogar? ¿Estás siendo abusado físicamente, verbalmente, sexualmente, aunque no sea tu pareja? ¿Sabes que si alguien te obliga a tener sexo, eso es violación, aunque sea tu esposo? ¿Sabes que si alguien... Perdón. En el momento que yo estaba viviendo violencia doméstica para el hospital, perdí un embarazo de cuatro meses. Cuando estaba con el doctor, yo deseaba decirle lo que me estaba pasando. Yo quería que me preguntara esas cosas, pero no me miraba a los ojos. Siempre se mantuvo atento a la computadora y se, se mostraba muy acarreado. Yo sentí que le estaba robando su tiempo y que no importaba. Si él me hubiera preguntado esas cosas, mi, mi vida fuera totalmente mejor y más saludable. La violencia doméstica afectó mucho mi salud. Desde entonces padezco en migraña y muchas molestias en mi cintura. Gracias por su atención. Gracias, Ana. Um, so, as Ana shared, it's important um, to know that survivors do want to be screened. They do want to ask, how are things at home? It's not that they don't want to ask. They do want to ask. Also, there may be fears, but they do want the doctors to um, speak to them about intimate partner violence. And I want to highlight that it provides an opportunity for an intervention um, and to be able to make the connection that this is why these things are happening. This is why these health conditions are coming up for you. And going over the limits of confidentiality is very important. 
um, to let them know that when is it that a mandated report need, needs to get done and what are those limits of confidentiality. Also, paying attention to body language. How is it that you're interacting with um, the patient? How, um, not, even, not even if you're a doctor, but just in general, if you're providing services to a survivor, what's your body language letting them know? So it's very important to know that and also pay attention to the bedside manners, how they call it in, in the medical field, um, because your body language can say a lot. Where you're looking at, um, if you're making eye contact, if you're taking the time to pay attention to them and make that eye contact. Um, also communication leads to education and empowerment. Having that relationship with the patient can lead to other conversations and you can even empower them um, to take control of their health. And so now we're gonna have Diana share as to why it is important to um, screen for intimate partner violence. Adelante, Diana. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Diana Martínez. Soy sobreviviente de violencia doméstica y miembro del Comité de Mujeres Fuertes de Next Door Solution por más de cuatro años. Quiero compartirles que soy sobreviviente de violencia doméstica en mi matrimonio de 30 años. Esta violencia doméstica afectó mi salud ya que me enfermé de gastritis, colitis nerviosa, depresión y ansiedad. En un momento estuve muy mal por tres semanas y mi esposo nunca me llevó al doctor. Como inmigrante, yo no conocía la ciudad y cuando pude salir a la calle me perdí y tuve miedo. Luego en una iglesia conocí a alguien que me llevó a una clínica médica. La primera vez que fui fue por un dolor de espalda y cabeza muy fuerte. Y le dije a la doctora, pero ella solamente me preguntó varias veces qué tanto me dolía y me revisó con un aparato por encima de la ropa. Me hubiera gustado que me levantara la camisa y revisara la espalda y que me preguntara qué me había pasado. Al final, ella solo me recetó Tylenol para el dolor. Al llegar a la casa, le dije a mi sobrina que me revisara la espalda y me dijo que tenía un morete muy grande. El dolor no se me quitaba, ya que mi esposo me había empujado muy fuerte contra la puerta y se quebró. La segunda vez que fui a otra clínica, la doctora tampoco me revisó mi espalda y me hizo llorar con su mal carácter, ya que no me entendía lo que yo le decía y me gritaba. Yo a ella sí le dije que había pasado por violencia doméstica, pero no me dijo nada. Ella no me refirió con ningún recurso para hablar sobre mi situación de violencia doméstica. Solo se mostraba molesta cuando yo hablaba ya que no entendía mi inglés, pero yo hablaba como podía. Solo quería que me entendiera. Después, ella trajo a un asistente médica para que me interpretara, pero yo estaba llorando y la doctora enojada. Cuando se terminó mi cita, me refirió a otro hospital para hacerme unos estudios porque había resultado prediabética. Pero cuando llegué al hospital, me hicieron firmar unos documentos y luego me cobraron y eso me estresó demasiado, ya que no tenía dinero para pagar. Si yo hubiera sabido que me cobrarían, no hubiera ido a hacer esos exámenes. Unos meses antes de la pandemia, fui a un hospital por un dolor de cabeza y mareos, y el doctor me dijo que tenía vértigo y tensión. También a él le conté que había pasado por violencia doméstica, aunque él no me había preguntado, pero igual no me dijo nada. Mi situación migratoria me causa tristeza y preocupación, así que también me afecta mi salud. Hasta ahorita no tengo un doctor primario, ya que tengo miedo de ir al doctor, que me hagan menos y que me cobren, ya que no tengo dinero para pagar. Me hubiera gustado que me hicieran preguntas y que me dieran información de recurso, porque tal vez mi situación no hubiera terminado. No hubiera sufrido tanto y ahorita estuviera mejor. Y aunque lo hubiera no existe, me gustaría que otras personas no pasaran por lo que yo pasé. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Diana, por compartir. So, what I want to highlight from what you read, immigration status has a very big impact. Um, you know, 
sometimes when survivors have very hard and, and challenging experiences in, in their relationship, it, it can really impact, impact their self-esteem and create this fear. And when going to visit a, a doctor's office, if they have a bad experience, just like Diana did, that can trigger and instill even more fear and to voice what are those health um, access needs that they have. Um, so immigration status really heightens the fear. Health access can also be challenging, especially if your immigration status is another barrier for that. Language access is a huge barrier, as we can see it even now with technology. Um, language capabilities can be challenging. Um, and so that's something that we need to look at in, in order to achieve equity and, and address those inequities that exist. And it's very important to be trauma-informed. As Yana shared, she noticed that the provider got really angry and upset. And so we want to be trauma-informed because we don't know what someone experiences, what happened to someone. And so we need to, we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. And so I will pass it on to Elizabeth. Let me stop sharing really quickly. Actually, it's going to go to uh, Melissa. Let me load up the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so apologies, well, I just do strip, go straight through and skip right. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, before I begin, thank you so much to me there for sharing your story. Um, and I am. Um, uh, so sorry that our systems failed you. And, you know, hopefully through, through this work that we're doing here, we can do better. So, in terms of what we can do um, as systems that care about the health of our communities, uh, that want to support survivors. Um, so we uh, have been uplifting a model called Hughes. Uh, for those of you who are healthcare providers, um, you are probably familiar with a screening model of intimate partner violence. Uh, so five or six years ago, that was the best practice. It was usually three screening questions leading to a uh, potential report to law enforcement and other interventions. Um, so, you know, at, at uh, ACI, the questions that, you know, we reviewed were within the past year, have you been hit, slapped, kicked, or physically hurt by someone? Are you in a relationship with someone who threatened or physically hurt you? Um, has anyone forced you to have sexual activities that made you feel uncomfortable? Um, so very direct questions, very focused on physical abuse, um, and with an eye to making a mandated report. Um, so that was the old way. Uh, and what happened in the ensuing years is we had uh, Futures Without Violence, which is a national resource center focusing on health and IPV. Um, we had the Blue Shield of California Foundation. Uh, we had a cohort of agencies, um, really groundbreaking agencies, trailblazing agencies like Nextdoor, uh, Mayview Health Center, um, that were really looking at what could be the best model um, for survival wellness. And, uh, you know, so they, they tried on the screening approach, um, and that led to cues, which is an evidence-based model focused on universal education. So, uh, cues is the current best practice, um, to support patients in getting help with intimate partner violence. It is no longer recommended to ask those screening questions. Uh, you know, hopefully, as I've read those questions, um, 
you know, kind of see it, it puts people on the spot, um, doesn't necessarily create a safe environment. Um, could be re-traumatizing, is very focused on, on the physical. Doesn't even begin to talk about all of the other impacts, um, all of the, you know, the mental health and trauma triggers. So what Qs tries to do uh, is really focus instead um, on normalizing these conversations around intimate partner violence. Uh, you know, talking about intimate partner violence in terms of, of health and wellness, what it takes to have a safe and healthy relationship. Um, it's about really leveraging the, the trusting relationship that a patient already has with their healthcare provider um, to have what can be a difficult conversation um, and in really building a strong and supportive relationship. Uh, so the goal is not to disclose. Um, if a survivor wants to disclose, um, that's fine. And the provider will be able to support and be able to provide those warm handoffs to other agencies as needed. Um, but you know, ultimately, uh, it is all up to, to the survivor and what they need in the moment and about empowering them um, to seek what they need. So the reason it's called Cues uh, is because, because it focuses on um, three basic areas, C for confidentiality, uh, UE, universal education empowerment, S for support. So in terms of the C piece and the confidentiality, uh, so this piece really focuses on uh, what we call rooming alone. Uh, so the idea is that, um, you know, one of the, the first steps to building that trust and making sure that a survivor can share if they like and be comfortable um, is to ensure that when they enter the healthcare setting that they, you're able to have this conversation um, in a separate room, um, especially because oftentimes um, in an abusive relationship, there's a lot of monitoring, uh, the abuser or um, other people who are con who are controlling the relationship may have um, joined them or accompanied them to the health center. Uh, and grooming alone just seeks to address that. Um, so I'm going to show a video that highlights that. Um, okay. So here is the CUES. Just for everyone to take a look at that. Okay. And then let me share the rooming alone video. Sorry if this is making you late. I can stay here by myself if that helps. You know that that can't work. Look, I need you to be home when I call you from work or else I start to worry about where you are. Of course. Besides, I want to know what's going on with you as much as you do. Sure. Good. Now I'm glad that you're thinking this through. Jocelyn? Okay. Yes. Oh, good. And you are? I'm Jocelyn's husband, Michael. Well, I'm glad you came in. We like to see supportive husbands. Now I'm going to take Jocelyn in the back and we'll come get you later on in the visit, okay? What? Well, I figured since I am her husband, I'd be able to go back there as well, especially since I came with her today. Besides, I'm uh, worried about the symptoms she's been having. He is. I'm sorry. It's just clinic policy. We always see the patients first by themselves and then come back and get friends and family later, afterwards. Oh, okay, that's, uh, that's disappointing. All right, I'll uh, be here waiting for the callback. Great. There are magazines in the corner, I think men's health and people. Uh, that's okay, I'm, I'm fine. Jocelyn, come on back.
Yeah, fun to switch back and forth between the screens. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, we're not going to go through these questions. Uh, but, you know, just want to um, highlight, you know, the importance of just, just assessing every piece of the CEU's approach for, um, you know, your own healthcare setting. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit later, then in particular for Aki, um, we looked at what pieces could perhaps be a little bit more culturally responsive. Um, so PUSE is an evidence-based practice. Uh, and we, of course, always have an eye to um, whose evidence and whose communities. Um, so, you know, we do always want to be critical of that. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so those are the questions for future reference. Okay, um, so as we heard uh, in the previous panel, um, really important to uh, discuss confidentiality with a patient and a potential survivor. Um, really understanding uh, the mandated reporting requirements, um, which are different state by state. Uh, the way we address that at ACI was through conversation training, bringing in experts, especially an attorney, um, to address questions around liability, uh, looking at scripts that the providers could use um, when discussing this with patients. And we, um, we also updated our NOPP, our Notice of uh, Privacy Practices. Um, so a lot of, of behind the scenes work before we roll this out. Um, we also talked about, you know, adjusting workflows um, and even, you know, adjusting how we navigate the clinic space uh, because you do have to create that, um, that separate room for rooming alone. Okay. So in terms of the universal education piece, uh, Futures Without Violence um, has this really fantastic card uh, that can open the door to the conversation, which is available in four or five different languages at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, the, we're not going to show every piece of the card, but the idea really is to, to open the door to talking about how relationships are affecting your health. There are some key questions um, for folks to review. Uh, it's a very small card, um, so it's very easy to take or even to, to hide um, as needed. Uh, two cards are given out so that patients don't feel singled or targeted out. Um, and so the conversation can be framed not about the patient, but about a friend. Here are two cards. Um, if you know someone that might, you know, might need the card, here it is. And they'll know that there's a second card that they can perhaps keep for themselves. Uh, and the idea really is, is about just planting a seed. It's not necessarily getting in depth about, um, you know, again, about those screening questions um, and really letting survivors know that resources exist. Um, and that when, you know, if and when they are ready to seek help, that that help can be available. Okay. Uh, so as Erica had discussed, um, and as Okomite had talked about, um, patients really do want us to talk to them about IPD, and disclosure really is not the goal. So uh, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go extensively through this, but we have given you some of the scripts that actually we use, uh, and we did end up translating in multiple languages. So that's a script for the MA. Uh, and then of course, there's a the support piece. So as we mentioned earlier, survivors who talk to their providers about IPV are four times more likely to seek an intervention, right? Um, I think oftentimes there can be some, um, some fears around saying the right thing or, or you know, perhaps saying the wrong thing. Um, and I think what, what's really important is, is more than the words, it's really just conveying empathy, support, being open to the conversation, um, providing validation, um, and letting patients and survivors know that resources are available. So again, we have sample scripts for you all. Um, and these are the scripts that we use at Aki. Okay. Um, of course, we do, as we create that trusting environment, we want to make sure that we're not victim blaming. So um, things to not say. Okay. Uh, and then the last piece with the support um, is around that, you know, warm referral to a victim service agency. So uh, I think that, um, especially in the health healthcare setting or folks who 
um, have counselors on staff for integrated behavioral health. Um, it, it seems very natural to refer um, a survivor to a behavioral health counselor. Um, and certainly, you know, BH counselors are well trained uh, to provide trauma informed care and to provide um, a very high level of support. Uh, the best practice for cues is to refer to a, a victim service agency and a confidential advocate. Um, the work is a little bit different. Uh, domestic violence advocates have um, a different and actually a higher level of confidentiality than HIPAA. Um, services at domestic violence agencies are free. Uh, and the case management provided um, addresses, you know, the, the full scope or a broad scope of the social determinants of health, right? So a referral to a domestic violence agency can lead to, um, you know, not just the emotional support or practical as well, legal, access to housing, access to um, shelter, uh, to food resources, um, employment, and uh, opportunity, self-sufficiency, support, social services, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, another piece is that domestic violence entities are not, not mandated reporters, um, which can create a, a different level of trusting relationship um, that can be a complement to the relationship uh, with the health provider and with the behavioral health counselor. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, just demonstrating all of the services uh, available through those domestic violence agencies, um, something of a systems map. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I want to highlight the importance of having a trauma-informed approach through all of this because survivors of domestic violence are survivors of trauma. Um, health providers are seeing the physical and mental wounds of that trauma um, and may experience vicarious traumatization themselves, right? Um, so really want to highlight for um, our staff the importance of self-care, building resiliency, um, considering our own trauma triggers, uh, considering that our own staff may be survivors or have witnessed abuse um, or have supported another survivor. Uh, and, you know, just, just talking about what, what implementing this model may mean for the staff um, themselves and their own processing. Uh, we also took a look at um, state law and workplace protections for survivors. Um, you know, in, in case there were staff uh, who did need support. And uh, we actually um, re redid our HR policy. Okay. okay, so now I will turn it over to Liz. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Erica, as well, for your presentations and for El Comité. It's very important to hear from survivors throughout this process. So. Go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the local project that we've done here at Aki. I, um, I work in the health center at Aki. Melissa works for our domestic violence program. And uh, this is sort of our story of, of how we got started on our project. Um, what we based a lot of it on was actually the work that Erica had done uh, a couple of years ago in 2014 and 15. She, uh, next door and Mayview Community Center, which is located north in Sunnyvale, Palo Alto, um, did, a, did a project where they implemented screening questions and also resources for domestic violence. So they developed a toolkit that had nine steps that was very, very helpful. So that was one of the things that we started our work with. Um, and this was an integration project. When we talk about integration timeline, this was an integration project between Aki's Health Center and also our DB program. So even though we were in the same agency, um, a lot of times we become silos because of funding and what have you. So this was really looking at how can we better partner with each other. Um, so uh, another thing that we used was we had had an intern who did a lot of research about domestic violence. She actually developed workflows. She updated policies and procedures, developed training series. Um, and she had also developed a 54 page toolkit. So she was great, Mandy is her name. And she did a fantastic job, basically um, pretty much started us out. So between her work 
and the work that um, Erica and uh, maybe you had done, we were really well set up. Um, Vandy had done her work and then we had turnover in the health center staff. So the project was actually never implemented, unfortunately. So I was hired in 2015. Melissa and I started to talk about issues that, that we were encountering when she was referring our, uh, our patients, our clients in our DB shelter over to the health center for resources and what some of the barriers were to getting people in for healthcare. So, and some of the, some of the barriers that we identified is services need to be low income. Survivors don't necessarily want to use their insurance. Um, getting in the, an appointment in our health center needs to be easy and there are certain barriers that get created. Um, survivors needed both medical and behavioral health services and we're lucky to be able to provide integrated behavioral health services. Um, our staff were not really aware of IPV and the prevalence of IPV or the limits on confidentiality with IPV. So one of the first things that we looked at and, and Melissa and I met a lot uh, over the course of a year and we looked at what are the key drivers for each of the groups of people. First for the DV survivors, safety was very important, privacy was very important and accessibility uh, being accessible or having easy accessibility to healthcare services. For the DB program itself, confidentiality was very, very important. Um, and the confidentiality is, is different. It's more restricted for good reason in the DB program than it is in the health center. For the health center perspective, the impact on workflow I'd say is the key driver because the way our health center, all health centers are set up is you have a certain amount of time with each patient. You have to achieve certain things within that limited time. And so you're always looking at um, how might an intervention impact that workflow? Um, because it, it, if it impacts one part, it impacts the whole day and it impacts all patients. So in uh, February, 2009, so, so Melissa and I had been uh, meeting, we were thinking of doing screening questions like they had done at Mayview, the three screening questions. And one of the things that we did um, was we talked to other uh, projects and other agencies that had done this work and Futures Without Violence had obviously done a lot of work on this and in February 2019 is when they first came out with uh, universal education or their cues approach the confidentiality universal education and support this was the first time we had heard about this approach we had a long conversation with Futures and decided to change our entire approach and not do screening at all and to do universal education instead. So this um, seemed like a better approach because it wasn't, um, it wasn't so putting people on the spot in terms of making them disclose and more of a, of a partnering approach and more of a sharing resources approach. So we thought that that would be a better way to do it. Our providers and our staff were also um, more comfortable with this approach. So we decided to do that. This is just a quick screenshot of cues and what is in each section. So you can take a look at, at, um, at the PowerPoint, which is actually on the, the website already. And then in March, right after we had talked to Futures, uh, we found out there was a grant available, so we applied for it. Um, and this is Gerard, who's our Director of Wellness Services, who helped us with that grant. And then we, in, in terms of all of our reading, in terms of what Nextdoor Solutions had done with Mayview, we actually called Erica and asked her to provide technical assistance to our project. And this was very key. We, we actually were able to skip a lot of steps because Erica had had the experience with a clinic already going through this process. She's also, um, she also used to work as a medical assistant at Planned Parenthood. And so she had the understanding from the clinic perspective about how um, DV screening or, DV, or providing DV resources might impact the clinic. And that was extremely helpful. So I would say it has been a key to our success. And basically what we proposed to the county is that we would train our staff 
Um, we would then do a pilot program where we would uh, do an English speaking group um, of, of patients and try the rooming, do the cues model, rooming alone, universal education and support. Try it on a small pilot of English speaking patients and then do it on a small pilot of uh, Asian speaking patients, probably Mandarin because we have a, a majority of men, Mandarin speaking patients and then think of how we might roll it out to the whole clinic. So in September, we did a training for all of our health center staff that was about 30 people. Um, our health center staff had not, we had not really talked about domestic violence or intimate partner violence very much. Um, Erica and Melissa had done many trainings on IPV before, but we took what they had already done and, and really looked at what our staff would need the most and um, really tailored it to their needs. One of, one of the first questions that came back from our providers was, when do I have to do a mandated report? What is involved in a mandated report? And they were worried about uh, how that would go. So one of, the, one of the most important things I think that we did is we set up a meeting where Ruth Silver Taub and Laura Brunetto came in and met with all of our our medical providers and talked about mandated reporting, gave some real examples, answered questions about how often does this happen, what does it mean, and really helped answer a lot of the questions and um, some concerns that our medical providers had. And because we did this piece, our medical providers felt much more comfortable going forward with doing, um, doing a project on IPV. So that happened in October. And then in November, we had our second training in preparation to starting the first pilot. And uh, so we did the second training with our medical assistants, our nurses, and our providers. Basically laying out, we're gonna do an English speaking pilot, then we're gonna do a Mandarin speaking pilot, and then we're gonna see how we can roll it out to the whole clinic. Um, and so there, there are, one theme that goes throughout uh, this project is things completely changed. They went 180 degrees. The first uh, big change was going from screening questions to universal education. This was the second big change that happened where we had an idea of how we were gonna do this project. When we did this training with our staff in November, our staff said, no, that's not gonna work and we can't do it that way. And it was really um, very interesting. So. Uh, Melissa and Erica and I were in that training, we were doing that training and the feedback basically that staff gave us is that we needed to take into account some cultural factors with our patient population when using the cues model. Um, and this was a very interesting uh, situation and every clinic's patient population is different and so the impact may be different and that's one of the things we found out. But at Aki, our patient population is very mixed. So we have a lot of elderly Mandarin and Cantonese speakers. And then we also have a lot of other ethnicities of patients coming in. One of the things we had to look at was the dynamics of the waiting room and what's going on in the waiting room. Um, uh, patients are sitting in the waiting room and see, and, and for some of the patients, um, a concern is that they would get different treatment than other people. And what we realized is that there were certain trauma triggers for our patient population. Um, and that rooming alone would actually re-traumatize them. And this was, this was the feedback that our staff gave us, that separating them out and singling people out would actually cause more um, concern and fear and trauma, and that we needed to rethink that approach. Um, at Aki, we're very community-centered, and patients have a lot of input into their treatment. The goal is not to make sudden changes for our patients or for our staff. And so that was one of the real lessons for us. Um, and, and we realized our goal is not to trigger, not to traumatize or re-traumatize our population. So we needed to relook at how we might wanna implement it. And so what we did was we looked at a lot of other places that had implemented cues or had implemented another model. We realized, um, we still wanted to use the cues model, um, but one size didn't fit all. 
but it had flexibility within it so that you could you could change it you could um, modify it to 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 make to meet the needs of your population so we decided to do a modified cues model so what we decided to do was not not room patients alone not separate them which would re-traumatize them not room them alone at the start of the project but with the goal of getting there because one of the important things about the cues models is the confidentiality and talking to the patient alone uh, in the exam room so but we decided not to start with that and the fact that that cues is flexible and that uh, you need to take into account the cultural needs of your population was is also very important so we then um, had to talk to the county and they were wonderful and they actually said you're doing a pilot project if you need to change that's fine this is how we can do it so we changed from the idea of doing small pilots with different groups of our patients to we expanded it to all of our patients and all of our providers at the same time. So no pilot groups, but just do everybody in the clinic at the same time, which meant we had to translate all the materials we had um, into Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Spanish, because those are the three major languages that we see. Um, instead of just training a couple of staff who were involved in the pilots, it was training all of the staff. And it was looking at the impact to the entire workflow in the health center, not for just a couple of providers. In the pilot, we were going to pick a provider and an MA team, implement uh, the model with them, and see how it went. But this was a big change in terms of doing the whole workflow. And again, what we were going to do was, um, our plan was bring the patients into the exam room. If they came in with somebody else, that was fine. Um, do the universal education piece. So give them the card the healthy relationships card, uh, the MA would introduce it and then the provider would follow up. So, and this is uh, where we did the scripts, which Melissa referred to in her presentation. So we wrote out actual scripts for the MA to say and for the provider to say. And then when we did a training for all of the MAs and the providers and we had them actually walk through and say the scripts out loud. Um, for the MAs, we actually did it in an exam room. So we pretended to be a patient and had the MA talk to us as if we were a patient saying the scripts because we felt the more practice that they had actually saying the words, the easier it may become and the easier it might happen. So we started our pilot project in March, on March 9th to be exact, um, and we started to do the universal education um, we did it for six days and in that in those six days we gave out 78 cards and we actually had one referral for DV services um, and for that situation the the patient who had come in was uh, upset and sad and it was because of the empathy of the MA in how she talked to the person that the patient actually ended up disclosing and asking for help and then we made a referral to um, our DV program. So that really spoke to the importance of training staff, making them aware of what might be going on for a patient. Um, and that was a really good reinforcement of that. And then this was the third time that everything completely changed because um, six days after we started our pilot project, COVID hit and the shelter in place order went into effect. So we actually stopped bringing patients in uh, completely for um, that was happened on March 17th. So we did the pilot from March 9th to March 16th. Um, so in April, we, we then had to figure out how we were gonna do cues in a post COVID or in a COVID world. We were able to get funding. And as part of the funding, we got a part-time DV advocate that we could have in the health center two days a week. This was one of the reasons why our staff felt more comfortable doing this project is because they would have immediate resources available if something were to happen. Um, our staff were more comfortable with doing child abuse reports or elder abuse reports. They were not so familiar doing mandated reporting for domestic violence. And, um, and so being able to provide this resource for them because of the grant 
uh, was, I think, a good, a big reason why um, they were able to do this program. And we had Oksana Amador at that point. So in present day, we are still in the, in the middle of COVID and probably will be through to next year. Um, we are talking about, we have talked about doing not the screening, but doing the universal education over the phone. So we're now doing a lot of our visits over the phone or, or um, over video using Zoom. Um, there are, our providers do have concerns that there may be somebody in the room with the patient. It may place them uh, in danger. And so we've talked about that and how might we work with that. Um, our DV advocate unfortunately left, um, but the goal is still to uh, have that DV advocate available two days a week for the health center as an immediate um, resource. Um, what's been really important though, through the upheaval that COVID has caused is to, is to keep the systems changes in place, keep the project going, and um, making staff aware, yes, we're still doing this project. We stopped our pilot. However, it's still an important project. Um, I would say Melissa uh, has been the driver from the DV program perspective. I have been the driver from the health center perspective. And it's been important that we continue um, to keep it as a priority. Our CEO, Sarita, has also, um, is very much a supporter of domestic violence services especially being uh, provided in the healthcare setting. And she has also been very supportive. Um, and Melissa has also been involved in the East San Jose Peace Partnership, which has also put more attention on this issue and why it's important. So through all of the changes and the upheaval, um, it's important that we keep, we still keep our, our eyes on the prize and our goal and keep going no matter what happens. Um, as a result, what we saw in the first year actually was, um, so in 2018 to 2019, we had made two referrals between the health center and our, and our domestic violence program, our Asian Women's Home. And in the past year, the past fiscal year, we had 14 referrals and a lot more collaboration. It has, um, this has meant better care for our patients and it's also led to other things. So reducing barriers to access in, for the patients that are in our DV program currently, um, because our staff now have an understanding of DV and what it entails and how it impacts um, our patients, uh, we're able to respond more quickly. We're able to um, work our system a little bit better. We've also extended support for the whole DV network in terms of providing uh, no cost uh, COVID testing to any staff member who works at a DV program in Santa Clara County and also for any client who wants COVID testing. And we can set that up. And this is a picture of our medical director, Dr. Kameth, who is also a big supporter. We, in the middle of the project, we also had a changeover of three of our major staff, uh, management staff, and so that was also um, it was important to keep, keep it going, keep the project going, and keep that focus. And we've also uh, provided specific outreach and information to the DV agencies, uh, the DV network agencies that are in this county. So it's made that relationship much stronger, uh, which has been great. And there's a lot of lessons learned that we've had, so we've put down some of them here. Strong executive leadership from our CEO is critical. Um, sh having shared visions and values as we do this program. So Melissa and I were, were very aligned, I would say, in terms of our commitment to this project and um, really being tenacious, <laughs> I would say, and keeping it going and being committed. We met a lot we, in the first year and, and even before the first year, or before fiscal year 19 to 20, we met a lot. We met almost every week. And that ended up building a lot of trust and also a lot of understanding. And that's where Melissa got a better understanding of our um, restrictions here in the health center. And we got a better understanding of the restrictions in the DV program and what the priorities were there. And, when, and then when Erica came on board, that was, it was just um, really, really 
helpful. Um, we've had to be very flexible because we've changed things three times, 180 degrees, and so being flexible has been very important. Um, in terms of the perspective of our providers, addressing the mandated reporting concerns was very, very important. And we actually had to do it before we could go on and do any further training. Um, they really need to get their hands around that issue of when do they have to report, under what circumstances, um, and, and, and then we, of course, laid out, you know, what is the report, who do you have to report it to, we had to get all the fax numbers, all the phone numbers, um, but getting that done and addressed early was absolutely critical for our providers. Um, including cultural factors and the impact that that might have on whatever you're doing. Um, one thing that, that we found is that there's some uh, words about intimate partner violence that do not exist in other languages. And so explaining those concepts in other languages becomes difficult. And the words that you use, you have to be, you have to be very thoughtful about the words that you use. Um, and actually one of the things that our medical assistants requested is we had provided them scripts in English and they wanted the scripts in, the, in Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Spanish. So that would be easier for them to talk about them. Um, from our patient's perspective, one of the uh, strongest feedback was uh, making it clear that that we're doing this with all patients in our clinic. It's not just one group, um, so that it does so that patients don't feel like they're being singled out because you know their culture has an issue with this. That wasn't that wasn't it at all. It's that if we're doing this with everybody. This is a new clinic practice um, that we're doing with everybody, and we're providing resources and um, so that you can share these resources with your friend or family members if you know somebody who may be having these issues. So that was very, very important. Um, some things that we would do differently going forward and as we, as we move along, uh, we will be is involving more of our health center staff as we uh, design things and roll it out. Um, and also leveraging any available resources and information. So all of the work that Nextdoor had done with Mayview all of the work that Futures uh, Without Violence had done, they're developing the cards and we use their cards um, was extremely important. And we consulted with them a couple times through the last year and it was uh, just phenomenal. Um, so that's a little bit of information about our project, our specific project. Um, so I was gonna turn it, if, I don't know if there's any questions right now, but I was going to turn it back to um, Erica to follow up on this. Thank you, Liz. Um, are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So um, I, I really, um, really want to applaud Aki for taking this on and not only looking at cues from a, from a um, way to, uh, reduce the silo between the clinic and their domestic violence agency, but also looking at it from like a cultural cultural lens and, and really taking that on. Because we know to, to make change sometimes, especially in the clinics, they already have a lot to do and to take this on can be very challenging. And you already heard you know, the successes and challenges that they went through. Um, there was a question that I do wanna address. How are you handling the situation during COVID? You know, this is why we joined forces to do this presentation, because one of the things that we want to do is to promote the universal education piece. Um, because with screening, asking those yes or no questions, you're only going to get those that are ready to disclose, those patients that are ready to disclose about domestic violence, whereas universal education emphasizes on the importance of educating uh, the patient and making that connection of how uh, your relationship can affect your health and connecting them to resources and connecting all, all your patients to those resources, increasing access, especially right now during COVID and transitioning over to telehealth. I would say community clinics are being the ones uh, that are the most impacted because we didn't have those capabilities and they themselves are even struggling with funding 
to to make that transition to telehealth and some cl some community clinics had to join forces and come together because of, of of loss of funding so it's very important to look at those things as well and which is why el comité de mujeres fuertes um, you know wanted to participate and and give their um, their input because we also want to uplift those community voices and hear um, specifically from the leaders of the community of what's happening on the ground and what is it that we need to do in order to improve services and make those changes to better serve our most vulnerable communities. So with that said, I am going to pass it on to Anna that she's going to share why she thinks um, this intervention, universal education, is important for survivors. Adelante, Anna. Cuando un doctor tiene buena comunicación con el paciente, nos educa y nos empodera. Eso nos lleva a vivir con dignidad. La intervención nos brinda una enorme oportunidad y nos proporciona información de recursos que hay. Eso es muy valioso para nuestra salud. So I really want to highlight what Ana says. Um, because if you expand on the communication, you are empowering your patients um, to lead their lives with dignity and respect. And, and this intervention provides that opportunity to increase access to resources. Now we're gonna hear from um, Paula. Paula is another member of El Comité that could not be here with us today. Um, but we have Adriana, um, who is our prevention coordinator that's going to be um, saying her piece. <laughs> Okay, so as Erika mentioned, um, Paula was unable to be here, but she um, did take the time to write out her story. Um, and um, so I'm honored that she um, allowed us to tell you her story, so. Mi nombre es Paula Saravia, gracias. Por la invitación, como ya les mencionó Erika, soy miembro del Comité de Mujeres Fuertes. En verdad estoy muy emocionada de saber que se está trabajando en este proyecto de Hughes. Creo que con este proyecto de intervención temprana vamos a poder ayudar a los doctores y todo el personal médico a entender la importancia de tener, de poder educar sobre qué es la relación sana de esas personas que junto con sus familias están en peligro y viviendo violencia doméstica. Creo que finalmente vamos a poder tener un apoyo fuerte entre la agencia que está ofreciendo sus recursos para apoyar y guiar a la Adriana, we can't hear you. We lose her. I think we lost. Sorry, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, y al mismo tiempo, el médico podrá tener información de cuál es la situación de su paciente. Esto ayudará al médico a poder entender cuál es el origen del daño en la salud de su paciente. Al dar un seguimiento y brindar este cuidado médico, está, esto ayudará a prevenir daños severos físicos y mentales en el futuro paciente. Por eso es muy importante ganar la confianza desde el primer momento y cómo vamos a lograr esto solamente teniendo un entrenamiento apropiado como lo es el proyecto Cues. La gran meta es la intervención temprana. Con esto estoy segura que salvaremos muchas vidas y tendremos una comunidad unida y saludable. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, and so as you can hear, Cues provides us with an opportunity to do things differently. And now we're going to hear from Diana. Adelante, Diana. Okay. So I'm going to quickly um, try and um, read it in English. I am really excited to hear that Cues is being implemented. I believe that with this method of early intervention, we will be able to help doctors 
and all medical staff understand the importance of being able to educate those individuals and families that are at risk or experiencing domestic violence on what a healthy relationship looks like. I truly believe that among the doctors providing services and those that are a resource, we can have a strong support system and provide guidance to the person um, to get out of an abusive relationship. At the same time, the doctor will be able to have information about the situation of their patients. This will help the doctor to understand what is the origin of the health issue um, of their patients by following up and providing medical care. Um, it will help prevent severe physical and mental damage in the future of the patients. This is why it is very important to build a relationship and gain trust from the beginning. How are we going to achieve this? Only by having proper training such as cues. The goal is early interve intervention. With this, I am sure that we will save many lives and have a united and healthy community. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. So Adriana just read what Paula shared with us in English, just to clarify. Um, I'm sorry about that. And now we're gonna have Diana share to us why she thinks this intervention, universal uh, education on cues, is important. Adelante, Diana. Quiero decirles a ustedes, doctores, que tomen más tiempo con sus pacientes. Hagan preguntas, eduquen al paciente de cómo su relación puede afectar la salud y dándoles información de los recursos que hay en la comunidad. Tienen que ser más empáticos y hacia sus pacientes. Muchas veces por la situación en la que estamos, ustedes son los únicos recursos que tienen los pacientes. No necesitamos que el doctor nos maltrate o nos haga sentir menos cuando ya estamos pasando por eso en nuestra relación. Necesitamos que nos apoyen. Gracias por escuchar una parte de mi historia. Gracias a Nexdoor por seguir apoyándome por cinco años. Gracias. Gracias a ti, Diana. So I want to say what, what Diana said because it's very important. She highlights a lot of the things that we need in the medical sector, especially right now during COVID times. So she says, I want to tell you doctors to take more time with your patients, ask questions, educate the patient on how their relationship can affect their health and give them information on resources in the community. Doctors have to be more empathetic towards their patients many times due to the situation we are in, you are the only resource that patients have. We do not need the doctor to mistreat us or make us feel less when we are already going through that in our relationship at home. We need you to support us. And so I wanna end this part with letting you know that doctors do play a role. You could be a lifeline, especially now with children not being able to go to school um, because we do see incidents of violence increasing, not only um, for victim survivors of domestic violence, but for their children as well. And so you can play a role of educating and providing a resource that will allow individuals to get to that intervention sooner rather than later. Thank you. And so now we're gonna open it up for any questions. So we just um, want to thank you for this wonderful presentation and note there's a lot of um, comments, especially thanking um, the Comité for sharing their um, personal stories and how powerful this all is. So we'll be sure to share all the comments um, with all of you so that you can see them. But it's uh, um, I'm not seeing really questions as much as just lots of um, gratitude for the presentation. So maybe we'll give folks a few more moments to, if they do have a question they wanna put in, in the meantime, um, maybe I'll ask you all a question. Um, if there was something that would support you more in implementing cues and in, in what you're learning from all of this, um, what would be something that would support you in this effort? 
that those out listening can consider either if they're considering implementing it or if they're potentially in a position to help support this. I would say um, one of the things that can help is making it part of the quality improvement measures, um, making it as a requirement because you know, I've been in this journey for, I would say over five years now, um, trying to um, improve the way we screen in the medical sector and working with um, medical providers, I think by making it a requirement is the only way because if they have to do something and also providing the, 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 the support because the way the medical sector has been set up with the fee for service and um, it has been challenging because there, I, I get it from like the medical perspective that there's so many things that they already have to do. And now that they have to start addressing adversity, like ACEs, adversity in children and in adults and looking at social determinants of health, it can be a lot. And so it's looking also at the infrastructure of um, the clinical organizations and supporting in particular, I would say community clinics. Um, there, I can say two on the top of my head that had to merge with other clinics because they were either losing funding or because they weren't able to sustain themselves. And that's something that we need to look at because community clinics were developed in order to address um, these challenges that our most vulnerable communities go through. That's my response. I don't know if anybody else, Melissa or Liz, want to add to that. I would actually agree with that, Erica. Um, there are a lot of mandates that community clinics have to do, but making it one of the things that we have to do is one of the best ways to make it happen. And actually, our federal funder is considering that, um, although I hope they don't make us do screening. <laughs> um, I hope they can support doing universal education because it's a much, I think it's a much better way. Um, and provides support to a whole lot of people. And it makes your whole clinic, um, I think it's, it's just, it, it, it orients you towards providing support as opposed to asking difficult questions. Um, and it's much easier to provide support. So I think they may be requiring it, which um, will be difficult because of all the other things we have to do, but I think it's also important. And if there's any questions or comments for the committee, um, please feel free to um, state them. I can translate. Um, and I also want to tell them um, what the comments have been so far, which I will share afterwards to allow more time for others if you have any comments um, or want to say anything to um, our leaders of the community. Um, so for me, I think, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with what Erica and Liz had mentioned. And, um, you know, the piece around just just community health centers and staff just having so much to do already and working in a, you know, in a system that I think can be very challenging um, just because that's, you know, that's how the medical system was built in this country. Um, I would really just emphasize building the infrastructure to support the staff to do this work so that they can then support their survivors. Um, so, you know, looking at the workflows, the policies and procedures, um, you know, having those champions to provide the, the frontline staff, the MAs, providers with that support. We do have a, a medical question. Um, if a patient discloses IPV, what changes are made in the medical care? And then a, a follow-up is also, are strangulation or traumatic brain injury included in the differential for IPV? Sorry. You're if muted. a patient, yeah. If a patient uh, discloses IPV, um, we're able to put them in, in linked in with um, our domestic violence program and the advocate will follow up with, with the person right away. And we'll also support the provider mm -hmm. in terms of the steps that they may need to take for mandated reporting. No, um, we will be doing another training for our health center staff and providers. We focused a little bit on strangulation and traumatic brain injury as, as some of the side effects from DV. Um, 
so our providers are aware of it. Um, we could probably spend some more time on that and really give them some more information and resources about it, but our providers are pretty good at, at uh, looking at everything that needs to be looked at. I, I also want to add to that question. Um, so it's also important from, from the domestic violence and um, in terms of the organizations that provide those services to also be informed and in making the connection between domestic violence and health um, so that if it's not part of the screening process or it's not disclosed in the medical setting that we are also able to address it when they seek services um, from the domestic violence agencies. So it, it's, it's a twofold process. That's why these, um, these collaborations are very important. And that's why we're promoting the collaboration between the medical sector and the domestic violence agencies, because we can address these um, issues when they come up. Come up. So it's also important for domestic violence advocates to know the implications of uh, strangulation and traumatic brain injury so that if they're not being addressed in the clinical setting, we're also addressing them in the domestic violence agency. Melissa, you wanna add? No? Okay. And we now have the countywide strangulation protocol to help us do that. And I, I say that because I know it's Kim asking. <laughs> Okay, it may be um, just some time for some, oh wait, we do, <laughs> we have um, maybe one more question and the rest will be follow-up that we'll do by providing all the comments um, to the panelists. Um, and maybe we can wrap up with, do you know whether other health care providers locally are doing cues? I, I don't know offhand. Erica, do you know? Yeah, so we've been in conversation with Gardner. Um, we, right before COVID, we started the process of doing a needs assessment in their clinic setting and, um, and doing a training for their medical staff. But COVID has definitely put a halt on those, on those uh, processes, which we hope that we are able to pick up again. Um, there's also the, um, the, um, school clinics um, through Stanford that are looking into adopting this model. So I've been in conversation with them as well. Um, recently, we had a presentation around this model through the Community Health Partnership. And there's actually um, Mayview Community Health Center in Ravenswood um, that also um, has done universal education within their clinical setting and that they're wanting to um, get another training because now telehealth um, has taken over. So we're also in conversation with them as well. And, and this is a pilot. So I do imagine um, you're, you're doing the groundbreaking work for our, our county um, to really explore, you know, how, how we take it from this mo model um, to countywide. So um, we're very hopeful and, and grateful for what you're doing. Um, I, I do want to note, um, there's a comment about the importance of having clinicians trained on this and understanding how to interact and ask questions to support survivors while they're experiencing abuse and how important that is. Um, and, and again, I'm just repeatedly seeing a lot of gratitude um, and, and thanks for all that you're doing and especially to the survivors who shared. So I do wanna mention that we do have a, um, a pi another pilot going on, a strangulation response pilot, um, so that we're trying to identify um, DV victims who um, have experienced that so that we can um, provide additional medical care. Um, it does have to sort of um, reroute the patient to Valley Medical Center, but there are really interesting pilots that are happening in our county right now um, that I think will continue to be linked and um, really change the way that we're doing things here. So we're excited um, for all that you're doing. Um, we're excited for your partnership between Nextdoor and Aki. It shows, um, you know, just how much more powerful this is. 
Um, do any of you want to have any closing comments? And, and with that, I think we will actually end a few minutes early. I do. I do want to say something. When looking at these pilots, I think it's important to really have community input and really involve, um, if possible, uh, the survivor voice, um, regardless of what the pilot is, but highlighting and, and really looking at those challenges and, and um, taking into consideration like cultural aspect of things, um, just like how Aki did. Uh, I think it's very important and be able, um, flexible when um, adopting pilots uh, to be able to make changes throughout. I think that's what was important here too with um, the Q's uh, pilot for Aki that we, we were able to make changes throughout um, and really meeting and looking at what's working and what's not working to be able to make those changes. That I think is a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you so much to each of you um, for this wonderful presentation today. We wanna remind you that we do have a post evaluation um, and it's quick and fast. And then once you do it, you get your certificate of completion for this incredible um, session. And we have much more coming to you for the rest of the month. Um, so there's the, the code on your screen right now. You can also access through our website. Um, we have um, presentations next Friday and then a, a three half day strangulation response um, training on the 26th, 27th and 28th and our final session on the 30th. Um, but we are so incredibly proud to have been able to bring um, to our community the really important work that is happening around um, universal education. So thank you so much for all that you are doing and for this great presentation. Muchísimas gracias, el comité. Woo -woo. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing job. Thank you so much.